Well, the town I grew up in uh, had a tornado warning siren. And the only time I ever heard it ring for a tornado or sound for a tornado was one time. I heard it over and over and over as, uh, as an air raid siren. And in the 1950s, the United States had a lot of air raid drills. There were people putting bomb shelters in their backyards. And then there was the doomsday clock. And the doomsday clock was something that they talked about all the time on the news. And it was perpetually set at one or two minutes until midnight, until nuclear annihilation. So anyway, my dad, <laughs> my dad had been a conscientious objector during World War II. And that wasn't a very popular or very common thing. But um, it was uncomfortable for, uh, for his mother. She discouraged him from coming home for, uh, for the holidays because he wouldn't be in uniform and that would embarrass him. Well, after the war, he and my mom got married and they moved to Carlinville, Illinois. And that's a little town out in the farm belt. It's got a little college and my dad uh, got a job at Blackburn College teaching. And I was born in 1952. Um, we were the only Quaker family in Carlinville. And people didn't really know what to make of us. They really hadn't experienced um, that before. But my parents, uh, to them, it was really a pretty simple proposition. You just um, work for world peace. And then there are another number of other doctrines. Uh, and one of them was called speaking truth to power. And speaking truth to power is basically just dissent. And Quakers believe that basically you've got a, you've got a patriotic duty if you think that the government is going off the track, you got a patriotic duty to set the government straight. And so that was speaking truth to power. Unfortunately, this was during an era where dissent was viewed as disloyalty to the country. And so there's a little bit of tension there. Well, America was great in those days. America was really powerful militarily, militarily and economically. But America was also afraid. A lot of America was afraid. People were justifiably afraid of the nuclear bombs falling from the sky. But there was this other fear. There was this fear that America was being infiltrated by communist insurgents, and they were out to overthrow the government and to take over and make it a communist country. Well, one time, um, well, the cultural, one of the cultural centers in uh, Carlinville was the barber shop. And these barber shops, um, they were for men only. Women had beauty salons elsewhere. And you didn't need to make an appointment. You just walk in and you uh, wait your turn. And I'd, so I'd walk in about every two weeks and I'd pick up a comic book and sit down and then just listen to the men talking. And they'd talk about the high school football team and then sometimes the talk would turn to politics. And often when the talk turned to politics, it would turn to the communist threat, the Red Scare. And a couple of times, I was sitting there and I heard, heard men say something like, yeah. And then there's that teacher out at Blackburn College. We need to keep an eye on him. Well, I was in about third or fourth grade um, when my mom made a speech to the local school district. And the proposition was, the situation was that the school district, the school board had voted to do a public screening of a movie that was made by the US government, by the House Un-American Activities Committee. And the movie basically was just about all the communists that had infiltrated uh, America. Now, we thought that was bogus, my parents did. And they weren't the only ones. Um, the American Civil Liberties Union had made a rebuttal movie, basically calling on the, on the um, government movie. And so my mom's point in talking to the school board was, okay, look, if you're gonna show the first movie, the least you can do is show the second movie also, so that there's some balance to the situation. Well, about a day or two later, my mom took me aside, and she took my sisters aside, I think, individually. But she took me aside and she said, now, when the phone rings, it's better if you don't answer. Let, let me or your dad answer the phone when it rings. It's because we were getting threatening phone calls. And that put my mom on kind of a blacklist in town. Uh, she applied to be a teacher at Carlinville High School a couple of years later, and she got turned down for that because the head of the school board thought she was a communist. Okay? One day, I was out on the playground in elementary school, and two or three boys came up to me, and they said, well, you know, we're not going to play with you because uh, 
my mom says you're a communist. And not only that, his mom says you're a communist. And his mom and that, her, that woman over there, her, the girl over there, her mom thinks you're a communist. Everybody thinks, everybody thinks you're a communist. Well, fortunately, not everybody did, because I did have some friends. In fact, they're friends to this day. But, you know, I felt like I was walking around all the time with kind of a scarlet letter, like a big red C on my forehead, commie. And that was embarrassing, you know, it was, a, it was kind of a burden to carry. And I started blaming it on my parents. I started thinking, you know, if, if you guys could just conform a little bit, just be a little bit more like everybody else, this wouldn't be going on. But, you know, um, that didn't happen. There was one really kind of scary incident, though, where uh, Blackburn College was in the process of integrating. And Carlinville was an all-white town. So when Blackburn College integrated, that would be in the first um, people of color coming into Carlinville. And naturally, there are a lot of people that didn't think that was a good idea. And one night, there was a little cross burned on our lawn. My dad went out and kicked it over. But anyway, that's sort of the atmosphere of the 50s. But the 50s turned into the 60s. And then things started really changing fast. First, President Kennedy got assassinated. And then it was only two or three months later that the Beatles landed. And all of a sudden, everything changed. We had this cool new music. There was a whole new vibe. And America was just kind of rocking out. And the, the, the world that I had viewed in black and white all of a sudden became technicolor. It was just a big transition. But other things changed too. Um, the Cold War against the communists turned into a hot war in Vietnam. And after a couple of years, people started noticing, you know, there are a lot of bodies coming back to this country. And people started questioning the war. You know, dissent was becoming mainstream. And so the military was having trouble getting enough volunteers to volunteer to go to Vietnam. So it relied on the draft. And America had had, uh, you know, conscripted uh, military service since before World War II. But, you know, the draft, if you, were, if you were wealthy and if you had connections, there were all kinds of ways that you could get out of the draft. But if you weren't, well, then you might wind up like Terry Pratt. I was on the high school track team with Terry Pratt, and in my junior or senior year in high school, he came home in a body bag, you know, kind of brought it home uh, to me. Um, one kid in Carlinville took a shotgun and blew off his big toe to make himself in ineligible for military service. So when it came my turn to um, face the draft board, it was pretty clear what I was going to do. I was going to apply to be a conscientious objector, just like my dad had. And so I was filling out the form and going through it, and there came to a section that said, is your request to be a conscientious objector based on a belief in a supreme being? Well, I wasn't sure that I could check that box. I had a conversation with my uh, big sister Kathy about it, and she said, oh, no problem, just check the box, and then when, if anybody asks you about it, just say, well, my sister Kathy is a supreme being, and of course I believe in her. <laughs> and as great an idea as that was, I passed on it, but my papers came back almost right away, approved. And so I did my alternative service, and what that meant in my case was that I worked two years in a hospital, night shift, and I emptied bedpans, and I cleaned them out, and I'd clean up the people that had made the bedpans dirty, and I mopped some floors. And so after my time was up, I was back in Carlinville, and I happened into a conversation with a man who had been the uh, head of the draft board. And he said, you know, we didn't have any problem with your application because we'd been watching your family. We knew your family. Uh, we knew that your parents' beliefs were sincere. And so we didn't question your conscientious objector application at all. And, you know, by then I had come to realize that what my parents were doing, it wasn't intended to embarrass me. They were just promoting democracy in their own way. Thanks. <laughs>